our recordings, but sometimes we do. Yeah, I, occasionally I put them up. Um, they're good reference points back, you know. If, you know, in the ensuing 30 days, I, you know, I, can, I sometimes go back and check or I do download it and keep it on my hard drive. Yeah, I mean, there is a general weaving through various topics that goes on. So that's um, rare, mm. I think, to, to get well, it all in one place. You said something to me, Ranjan, when we last spoke um, about Ezra Pound and about how it must be an Ezra, how it must have been like to be Ezra Pound when no mm. one, did, you know, no one really kind of got what he was going on about, maybe. Yeah, that's a, um, it's an it's an idea I once heard. Yeah, yeah, and and at at points in my life, I've got I I have felt very much like that. Um, now, I, I've been working really really hard all year since January, and I've revisited all of that stuff. I I, I got into a discussion on the Tim Morgan blog, uh, the Surplus Energy blog. And a guy called Stephen Kurtz um, decided to come and um, I think for him it was a dick waving exercise. For me, it was just an interesting, you know, the guy had some questions and wanted to. Um, he, he's a strong materialist. Um, and uh, my very good friend who died in 2013, Judd Evans, was actually an uh, eliminative this philosopher and um you don't get anyone that's as close to solipsism as Judd was but we were you know we we were intellectually phase locked if you like you know to use Rupert Sheldrake's term and um so Judd and I had a lot of talks about spirituality what he called brain meat and his feeling that um effectively consciousness was an artifact of um mechanical processes and whilst no one could prove that yet he felt that science would in the end win out now on that point um david malone chaired a discussion at the hail wife festival in 2014 okay the Institute of Ideas have got it up on YouTube and it's well worth watching. And Rupert Sheldrake is on the panel. David is the chair of the panel. There's a um, an author and, and, and a really very insightful woman on the panel too. And there's also a, a neurosurgeon. Um, Cambridge neurosurgeon uh, professor and he, he's he's a hard materialist and Daniel Dennis is in the audience and Daniel Dennis of course is the guy you know brains and machines and all this sort of thing now that's an interesting discussion but this Kurtz guy um, he's what I would call a militant atheist and um, his his belief in atheism is so strong that he's one of the types of people that wants to go around um, really having a go at people that have any kind of spiritual faith. Now, um, I'm, I'm up for that. I'm all, all for a bit of knock about, you know, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it's water off a duck's back. Um, and a lot of the militant atheism you get uh, involves a lot of straw manning and this Stephen Kurtz um, posted a comment um, saying uh, you can't prove that there is anything non-physical this is what he said um, and he posted this under a discussion um, on, 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 on the energy blog and um, my own view is that idealism materialism um all points in between uh are not well basically they're not incompatible they're not mutually exclusive and i and i made the point very strongly in an essay i wrote in response to david's um documentary series why are we here which is brilliant um and the website is fantastic and the website of that documentary series 
has the long form interviews with all the people that made it into the final cut. Um, and it's fair to say that I've studied that documentary of David's in minute detail and discussed it with him and all, all of the long form interviews. Right. Uh, and um, there's a what's interesting about it or the most the most interesting interview in it for me was the one with a guy called martin nowak and and, and he's a, a mathematical biologist um and david is a mathematical and a, a, a biological anthropologist that that's what he did his degree in um and the interesting thing about Nowak's work is that it talks about symbiosis and about cooperators and competitors. And oh, him, yeah, 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 yeah. Did he do? Did he do a book called Super Cooperators? Quite possibly. Right. Quite possibly. Um, I, I don't. I don't tend to read popular science books. I tend to read scientific published. Sure, know, but just to, just to clarify, was he at Hay? No, no, yeah. no. Right, he okay. Daniel Dennett is a philosophy professor in the States. And uh, Dennett features in the a documentary, which was, I think, was made for Dutch television um, called uh, The Heretics. And one of the heretics is uh, obviously Rupert Sheldrake. And um, uh, Dennett and um, Hawkins you know, the fam famous meme man, as it were, um, and Rupert Sheldrake have got this ongoing beef. It's been going on for years. Oh, yeah. Now, Shel Sheldrake has an interview that went up last year on, on the um, uh, Russell Brand site. Russell Brand so, has an so, so just to clarify, this is Sheldrake, Hawkins and Dennett have beef. Dawkins. Sheldrake Dawkins, at... Sh Sheldrake and Dawkins. And Dennett. And Dennett right. and Dawkins have, have... David calls Rupert Sheldrake the Jack Black of biology, OK? Because he's, he's hilarious. He is the funniest guy. Um, but he's also absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's got a mind like a razor. Um, yeah, but is he an entertainer or does he... Or does he... You know, I mean, I take it you're not you're not you're not talking about him purely because of his entertainment skills. No, uh, well, it, 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 he's one of those rare people that um, can get get the point across. It's like David as well. I mean, David's the same. I mean, he's got a mind like a razor, uh, but he's got sufficient patience to suffer suffer fools. I I, <laughs> I, I struggle with that. I'm I'm not that person. So, you know, and I really admire them for it. And, and uh, uh, for me, I, I, I don't mind explaining anything over and over again, as long as someone's interested. But with this, this, this Kurtz fellow, OK, he described himself to me. OK, um, he, he said, uh, I've, um, I've been, uh, he said, I'm a dilettante, but I did study um analytic philosophy for 30 and, and i've been doing this stuff for 30 years and then he posted a link to a a wiki of philosophy uh with an article on a philosophical strawson and um uh for him that's it argument over so anyway he put a comment on my blog and uh i responded to the comment he dealt with the points that he'd made and then went on you know, and sort of uh, decided, well, well I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time actually just setting out the other side then. It sounds like you were trying not to be rude and you basically said, I don't need to be rude. There's nothing to be rude about. I'm not that impressed with what he's given me, but that's fine. I'll carry on. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's fine as far as it goes, but it's such a small part of the story. Now, this and this all locks in, you see, into Grub Street Journal, my my current contention that browsers are the new black. Um. And the final piece of the jigsaw was this morning. We've had the second frost of, of the autumn. And yeah. I, my wife went outside to drive our son down to school and uh, was getting the frost off the car and yeah. then waiting for it to warm up. So uh -huh. 
he was going off he went and i was sort of thinking about that and i was sort of thinking well that that's kind of like the internet um because uh the internet within the google browser is very much like driving a car without taking the ice off the windscreen that's you know that that is what it's like now fast forward now um the so 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 hold on the internet with the google browser means you've got the frost on yeah okay. absolutely um and um back on the 20, 23rd of september the open internet protocol and the alexandria people that obviously i've been liaising with since the beginning of the year uh, they won a competition uh, it was in wyoming it was the wyoming um blockchain con conference and they won um one of two places uh with this internet incubator company run by an ex-wall street trader um to go to dubai early next year for a big blockchain conference that's happening at dubai okay uh, and they won they won first prize in this wyoming thing which was twelve and a half thousand dollars um Devon sent me a, a message saying oh something really cool happened at the weekend um and he said it wasn't winning the prize that was cool it was a guy got in touch with him and this 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 guy that got in touch with him was one of the founders of something called stack exchange now stack exchange is a technical web yeah you can ask any question can't you sort of thing that's right and the guy that wrote that um uh has opened has started a new kind of browser you have to pay for it and you have to give a credit card to use it on your computer even for the free trial um which is called discourse now what he said is they wrote stack exchange to so that people didn't discuss things it was designed to crowd out any discussion that that's what it was um and discourse has been written completely the other way now this goes back then to neural networks and how we work and how we fit things together and the discussion the discussion um at hey and why that david shares is about metaphor in science oh really 2014 now, interesting so when you talk about metaphors in science um if you get into this stuff and watch david's film dangerous knowledge which is brilliant and David does own the full copyright to that. And I've been saying to him, look, we must re-release. Or maybe I think, I, think I managed to. It was quite funny because do you remember how I told you that I about three years ago, I did these courses at the adult education place around the corner in the philosophy of maths, calculus and infinity and Jorge Luis Borges. Well, I remember at the time wondering. Uh, and again, I do not present myself as any kind of a person who knows anything about any of this stuff. But I remember wondering um what the relationship was between the term Turing test and the term non-Turing language, I think it was, I've forgotten. Um, well, there were two things, a Turing test and Turing completeness. That's uh, it, yeah, so I remember uh, wondering... Turing completeness is about the halting problem. Um, right, yeah. Like knowing that an answer will come out of the computer or whether it will go into an eternal loop. And the Turing test is a computer being able to fool a human that it's human. So sure so yeah, yeah i came across the first i've separately since then obviously uh because i was able to follow what you just said came across the second uh and i was wondering what the relationship was between the two if there was one and um what the relationship between either of those was and Gödel's incompleteness theorem um again these are things i've heard of and i know they're important not yeah. necessarily do i understand them so because i was having that little wonder then um, when I googled that what I found really quite funny was that I decided right okay I'd like this in video form so that I have a bit more of a chance of understanding it and the only thing that came well, look, up was David's video David stops at, at, at Girdle um, and Girdle also came up with another theory or uh, proof um, which is called undecidability but undecidability was never published by Gödel. It was actually published by a Polish logician and mathematician called Tarski. And you need that's to it. Yeah, yeah. Tarski to, to 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 really get that. Yeah, uh, thanks. Because yeah. I ended up doing a class on this, 
uh, which I mean, I was just glad to a turn up, b uh, leave, having felt that I may have understood something, uh, well, but not it, all. Really all. But it was brilliant. It, 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 it's very important. Um, Turing obviously is a giant in computing and logic, um, and. Um, This, this, this idea of um, metaphor and then concision in explaining something. Okay. Now, what the guy from Stack Exchange is was basically saying was that they were doing the same as Nightline with respect to general discourse in the media. So if you watch um, Manufacturing Consent, um, there's quite a lot of clips on, on the internet. Um, there, 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 there's a YouTube channel called Ch Chomsky Chant, which was put up by an American academic that he and I had some contact together um, in about 2013. He, he, he connected with me on LinkedIn and stuff. Um, there was another American academic I linked with at the time as well, um, who uh, went by the handle of Anchard, um, and they've they've both gone off doing their academic careers, and 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 I'm a dangerous person for them to talk to. I mean, I I, I think I'm on a lot of blacklists. I, I like, for instance, I'm blocked by Kate Moore. Um, I mean, Kate Walworth knows less about economics and money than I. Do. It, it, it's just a fact. I think I, I don't yeah, I'm, think. I'm glad she's. I'm glad she's blocked you. I reached out to her a couple of times, and funnily enough, today we've got our book club, and I nominated her book for the book club. Modern and economics. yeah, I was so excited about it. And when I first came across it, I was just so excited. And when I read the first chapter, I was still extremely excited. Or it may have been the the introduction or the forward. But then gradually it dropped off. And anyway, I can see why she doesn't like you, because even when I try to interact with her, she was almost like a common purpose. Um, yeah, yeah to, to... I, I'm sure she is. I, I think the person you interviewed who I have a tremendous amount of time for is Anne Pettifor. Um, Anne Pettifor is just in an altogether different league to Kate Rawworth. She just is. Right. Um, so, um, but, but, what Rawworth is, is a popularizer of the narrative around yeah. the money question. And there is a website called The Money Question, which he's also involved in, which has hijacked the clothes of positive money. And positive money has been driven up a dead end. Um, ben Dyson is at the Bank of England on their blockchain. Research. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, I was I posted about this a couple of years ago, saying that basically it's become another NGO sock puppet. Did I tell you that there was a guy called Dyson who um, was part of the social credit movement in the 20s? There's an Australian guy called Dyson mm -hmm. who was a he was an illustrator, moves to England, I think lives in Kensington. And because um, I've got a couple of books on social credit and his name features quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I wondered whether it was a multi-generational play. What? For, for social credit, um, it's the... Um... Douglas. Douglas. Hey, Major Douglas, but there's something called uh, oh, what's it? Uh, something journal. Um, I don't know. I'll tell you. Uh, uh, it's kind of off my thread, but I will just uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed where you were going, so I don't really want to stop you from going there. I know. Um, I'll get back there. Don't worry. I mean, I can. I. I like I say, I, 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 my, my thinking on this is so clear now, and I've done such a lot of work on it, it, it really doesn't matter. We could come back. During, during, like, during, the, uh, during the Girdle course, when they went over the, I think, tasky explanation of the Girdle incompleteness theorem part one or two, then I remember the teacher said, oh, it's a bit like... I think I can't remember which terms he used, but it was something like taking a verb, no, taking a noun, turning it into a pronoun, and making it eat itself. Oh, 
Hold on, you're still there. Yeah, did you hear what I just said? No, I was concentrating on something else. Yeah. Something um, eating itself, taking a noun and it'll eat itself. Yeah, I got, yeah, exactly. So um, when we went over how the incompleteness theorem was working in terms of Girdle and Tarski was mentioned a lot, mm -hmm. then uh, this was in an evening class. Um, then um, the teacher at the end of it, you know, I'm sort of holding on to the chair and the teacher sort of says, yeah, it's a bit like, and I can't remember which words he used, but it was something along the lines of, it's a bit like turning a noun, you know, taking a noun, turning it into a pronoun and making it eat itself. I mean, that was his that was his sort of almost metaphor to describe the cyclical nature of what was going on. And I do remember it was it, it was very it, much it, a case of testing everything. Yeah. It's circular reasoning is, is basically what it is. Right. And um, the. I, I, I discovered David's documentary, Dangerous Knowledge, before I even knew David. So this is going back to the very beginning days when I was in when I moved to Sweden, I spent two years studying philosophy every day for hours and hours on end um and uh, that's how i met judd um and judd published something called the insight the, the anathenaeum encyclopedia which i've put on web three now it's, it's it's on the way back machine but after judd died the academic at oxford university that did him with it obviously wasn't paying the hosting um and so it just fell off the web which is just a great shame because it's the best. I mean, like Kurtz sent this link, which is at Stanford University for their philosophy portal, I think. So it, it's something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, what Judd put together is it, it's immense. It is absolutely amazing. And what a lot of people don't realize about ancient philosophy is Plato is incredibly accessible. People quote him and people think, oh, my God, that must be just so much to read. It just isn't. If you want to read St. Augustine, um, it's hard because there's so much of it. Loads and loads and loads. And of course, he's the carrier of the Roman church narrative uh, that crowded out the Pelagians, etc. OK, um, so effectively, um, this idea of metaphors, and this idea of mathematics being somehow a pure, um, untainted by any circular reasoning is simply not true. And this is Stephen Wolfram's point about mathematics is, a, is an artifact. OK, um, it, it's the Taoist idea of, um, you know, you, you, you can't know the unnamed. Once something is named, you, you then get to Kierkegaard's point. Once you label me, you negate me. This is what this is all driving at. And I think for very militant atheists, it's, it's a deterministic requirement for certainty. And I had a discussion with an American mathematician back in 2011 and um, he, he quit to me at one point he said well if you're going to say that you may as well say that musical notes are subjective and I said well actually musical notes are subjective I didn't I, you know, I, and I proved it to him um, and this is because what people don't understand about to get certainty in maths, you have to define your boundary conditions. OK. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Glassman, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Glassman says in his uh, modeling lecture, um, you have to define the terms of the domain and the domain with it, with, within which your model applies, i.e. your boundary conditions. And if you don't do that, it isn't mathematics. OK, so then you get to Klaus Johnson's point. He's a professor of applied maths at, 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 at Stockholm Institute of Technology. And um, he wrote a book called um, The Physics of Dr. Faustus. <laughs> uh, and um, effectively, you get into magical thinking if you go outside of the physical and you don't have your boundary conditions. The other thing that Klaus shows as well 
is that lots of people misapply things like mathematical integration, um, uh, which gets very important for derivatives. And um, the basic idea there is, is you can in, you, you can integrate equations if you are having a small effect from a big change. If you turn it the other way around and expect to predict a big change from a, 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 a um, big changes from small changes or whichever way around, it just doesn't work. That's not what it's for. But it hasn't stopped people using it incorrectly. Well, this is the point you see. Um, Klaus is an applied mathematician and an expert on finite analysis um, computing. Um, now, which, which solved a lot of problems which, 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 which simply couldn't be computed before because they had to do too many iterations at once, too many different things. Um, where Tarski comes in uh, and what he proved was that um, you can't prove a system within its boundary conditions without circular reasoning. You always have to appeal to an authority outside of 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 your domain. Now, I definitely, I definitely remember that bit because um, that bit makes sense, you know, or at yeah. least it, it starts to make sense it, when you hear it, it. It's counterintuitive to anyone that has absorbed the narrative of, say, people like Dawkins, who basically say we're scientists with respect to scientists. Now, well, can I just say this? Can I just say this, Roger? Given yeah. what you've just told me, I'm surprised that um, I haven't heard anybody openly advocate the Tarski Brexit because it's so <laughs> it's because it's it's so obviously self-contained. If you look at it from a self-contained perspective, so if you look at it from an MSM perspective, everything that's ever offered is all within this, within that, and then every so often you you see this way out. And then it gets self-contained again. Well, actually, there's a there's a there's a, a set theory. Okay, um, uh, what's it called now? Uh, I've written about this. You'll find it on the blog. But but there's um, set theory uh, deals with those problems slightly differently. And I would say that um, uh, Brexit is a set theory thing because you're not you know if Brexit happens whatever happens even with a sovereign brexit uh there's still the interactions with the rest of the world and if you look at um uh dr north's analysis of of all of that and his flexit book and he, he he's advocating like the him. Norway, yeah. richard north yeah um the, the 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 point is that you know no man is an island sort of thing so there is this interconnectedness idea um and uh you know it's like spooky action at distance with magnetism and what all of that stuff um and the easiest way of bumper stickering it uh is um this idea that science is very good uh with the hows but can't deal with the whys. And it's the why questions always, which fall outside of the boundary conditions of any formal language of mathematics. Effectively. Yeah, OK, yeah. yeah. It reminds me, when I was in Spain, everybody, everything was because crisis. You know, every, I mean, I was there in 2008, 2009. And so there's a point where, you know, every conversation was, you know, there is an economic crisis going on. So people just say, I crisis, there's a crisis, there's a crisis. You couldn't talk to anyone without anybody saying there's a crisis. So, you know, it, it was like, you know, you know how people use those sentences to say because X. Yeah. <laughs> end well, of the, end the, of the, argument. The crisis is encapsulated in what uh, the discourse uh, blog and the Stack Exchange inventor has basically said. Now, so he gets it. The other person gets it is Patrick Ryan and Patrick. Um, is the one that talks about the butterfly theory of spoofing the algorithms. OK, I, I'm trying to have a chat with Patrick because he gets it. He's the one that did the video where, along with the Google whistleblower, uh, where he says that Twitter is basically a computer game. 
and and the tokens that you get are the likes, the shares, you know, engagements. And it's the same process, funneling down, funneling down. Uh, uh, so it's keeping you in the frosty vehicle, to use the analogy that I used earlier or the metaphor from earlier. Um, and then the other person that gets it, of course, is, is, is Devon at OIP and Alexandra and Amy and, and all of his crew. Um, and, of course, Ted Nelson and Quanta and all of the early computing guys. OK, so the other people who get it are people like Joe Armstrong, who invented the computer language Erlang, um, who, who sadly died earlier this year. Um, and so once you get the frost off the windscreen and start looking, this is only a, a few clicks away of the web, all of it. Even the stuff that's gone into the Wayback Machine, which Ted Nelson is involved in, which, which I, I think is amazing. <laughs> um, because Xanadu and his Xanadu conception, which he came up with in 1963, um, pointed to the sort of ideas that, uh, that, that Rupert Sheldrake gets at with morphic resonance. And, and, and I mean, Russell Brand got this absolutely, you know, as I understood it when he was talking to me, he said, so what? It's like a big cloud. It's like, the, you know, like a computing cloud. And it is kind of like that. But if you watch the uh, metaphor talk that David do, does. Um, it's only like it, but but you can't confuse the thing with the thing in it of itself and the labels of it. So when you get into graph computing, graph computing, which is a pretty amazing thing. Um, th that's when you start to see how neural networks work. So back back at the beginning of January or in February, I wrote to David and, and, and sort of said, look. This is how Google's duplex works. This is how neural networks work. Here are two really good videos explaining this. OK. Um, this is the Patrick Ryan video and the Google whistleblower video. No, no, no this is another one. I, the last few blogs I've done over the last week, this is all in there, but there's a, there's a whole ton of it. Um, but to to approach this this idea mathematically as set theory is the way to go. Okay, um, forget about um, Tarski and Girdle for now. Um, and, and use set theory. And set theory is kind of similar in my way of looking at things to Ken Wilber's um, integral theory and, and, and AQUAL, all quadrants, all levels. Um, and this is a multi dimensional thing. And this is the point that I made to the mathematician in America um, about musical notes being subjective. I mean, what I explained to him is, is that. And this goes all the way back to Pythagoras and, 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 and the theory of, um, of harmony. Um, the musical scale is just a division of an infinite series of pitches, of frequencies. And we train our eyes to like a certain relations between them. Uh, so this is when you get into modes and mode theory. Um, and of course, then you get you get back then to ancient philosophy where they studied, you know, music, harmony, rhetoric, you know, the, the, the tri thingy, whatever. Um, it wasn't yeah. really writing an interview, you know what I mean? So, so yeah. anyway. Um, the trivium. The trivium, yeah. So, uh, and all that's been thrown out the window because it's too dangerous, you see. From, from that, you get new innovation, you get progress. What you don't get from that is a top down hierarchy where kings can be gods and it's the divine right of kings and all the rest of it. Then you get into Augustine and, 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 and uh, Pelagius and what that argument was all about had nothing to do with God. It had to do with the divine right of kings. And that way of trying to um, justify the cutting of the cake. Then you so you get to Plato again and the noble lie and um, Magnesia and um, and all of that, you know, the two the two uh, cities in, in, in the Republic. Calliopsis and, 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 and Magnesia. So 
and, 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 and the idea of gold, silver and bronze people, citizens. Um, now, and, and Roy Madron made this point in Guy and Democracies, and I, I, I posted a video of his, back in 2003, he did an interview, which I put a slideshow over, because it was only available as, as audio. Um, and it's on the Super Confident Democracies YouTube channel that I made for Roy. And um, what he says, and he's absolutely right about that, is that the ruling elite are hard Platonists in terms of um, his view of the Republic, all the way down to exposing babies. Right? And of course, Murray Rothbard, if you read him, you know, uh, he talks about exposing babies, you know, in the sense of... Uh, Did you say exploding babies? No, exposing. It, it, yeah. expo dying of exposure. You, you leave... Oh, you, don't, don't clothe them. Yeah, it, it, it's the opposite to the Marine Corps, no man left behind. It's like you leave behind the useless eaters. So this is, at, this is at the deep end sort of thing, learning to swim at the deep end, throwing, throwing them in at the deep end sort of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, similar. <laughs> it's a very strong social Darwinist view of the survival of the fittest and the Hobbesian view of nature, you know, uh, was it red in tooth and claw and all of that stuff, right? Um, and it's a narrative which requires protectors. So, which is the whole idea about, you know, you, you scare the pants off them and then they'll do what, what you say if you say it's a protection racket. That's how the mafia works, for God's sake. So, well, the, j just, just to say this quickly, um, the, the book, which I need to be making some progress in before four o'clock today, um, this, you know, I've uh, known about it all, The Colour uh, of Money. It says... Uh, the, co the colour of by your f everything's blurred unless it's next to your face. Oh yeah, that's it. I forgot. That's <laughs> uh, no, blurred still. This you know, I can't read it. Right. Okay, so it's the colour of money, black banks, and the racial wealth gap. I think it came out at the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's by this woman called Mersa Baradaran, and um, she's on Twitter. Um, she did a tweet yesterday which I replied to by saying that I'm reading and listening to her book which is brilliant um, it's uh, how does she determine her how does she define her terms of reference what, what are the boundary conditions of, 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 of the general of the group? racial wealth gap well yeah. does it examine the specie money and explain what money is before looking at the gap for instance that the gap yeah. exists yeah. yeah 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 no i knew i knew this would come doing up. that you won't understand why it exists yeah i knew this would come up um what it does in terms of numbers uh it's more telling you a historical story that's not to say that it's not using any type of so her background just to be completely clear her background appears to be law and she does appear to be uh on the but she appears to be on the rigorous side of law though um so it's a history book and it starts off with a question quite early it says the median uh wage in america and the median wage in the black community uh is one over 15 and oh. and it basically says that hasn't changed for a long time let's talk about that oh. um so it doesn't i've only read the first sort of 50 pages and it hasn't I mean, don't get me wrong, it has definitely mentioned, because uh, you can't, I mean, actually, you know, you're completely right, you know, and I, I, that's why I'm not just going, oh, fuck off, Roger. Um, you're completely right in the sense that how can you deal with civil war related activity um, without at the same time dealing with what came from that, which was the, the gold, the silver and all of that money stuff. And she doesn't skip it out. Yeah, she doesn't skip it out. She does go there mm -hmm. uh, because but the way that she does it, she does it a little bit like sort of chapter two of Perry Merling. Obviously, he's a, he is more money focused. But what she does is she talks about certain characters that were because it's done through the prism of the first few black banks. 
Okay. So she sort of tells you what they were, who was there. Uh, not all of them. It's not a list, and it, it's kind of done like that. Either way, um, I think I know you're a busy boy, but um, I don't think this is uh, in the automatic exclusion zone. You know, I think you could get something out of some of this stuff, even though. No, no I'm sure crazy. I would. I'm, I, it's just that um, if it's written looking for an answer to a problem, uh, that's very important. What lawyers tend to do, uh, and, and, and a lawyer did get involved in this other discussion. Um, which, which interesting, was, uh, interesting. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim, 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 Tim's blog. Um, and lawyers are about, they're not about justice, they're about justification. What they are, are basically, um, they are justifying the enforcement of, of the rules. And the rules... OK, I, I like a set of axioms, but those ax, axioms and their boundary conditions are defined by the ruling elite. Now, most lawyers are concerned with perpetuating that and their thing in, within it. Same with doctors. Most doctors are for perpetuating big pharma. OK, and this is a point which um, John Ruskin makes in um, Unto This Last, uh, when... He basically poses the question, what would doctors think about the panacea that cures all ills? Would they be for hmm. it or against it? You know, I give you GC math. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, of course they're going to be against it because they, they, they basically it, 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 a large proportion of people really don't want to get booted off the gravy chain. Brexit. That's exactly the same thing. You know, uh, and, and the, the, the point is, is that. Um, when these things are questioned more deeply, the artifices come to mind. So Plato's, Plato's allegory of the cave, it's that exactly. You know that the, we're looking at the projections on the wall. The guy goes out and says, oh, my God, that's what we've been seeing. Goes back in to tell everybody and they rip him to shreds because they all believe the shadows on the wall. That's that's. Plato's allegory of the cave, um, but that's almost that, that's almost like the Prince by Machiavelli being a hand a handbook of government rather than a question of how not to do it. For which well, you on on that on that on that subject, I've got a book which I found at Houseman's, the second hand bookshop, the Peace Bookshop, or whatever history books bookstore. I've got a book there called. Um, the role of Machiavelli in English politics, uh, 16th and 17th century. Funnily enough, it's written by a man called Rob, um, mm. who managed to both be a lawyer and and the foreign okay. secretary at the moment. But I don't think it's his dad. Um, but uh, it's really interesting the way in which they show the first appearances of the term Machiavelli in yeah. English in yeah. English uh, it's politics, and it's very early, you know, and it's coming from France. There you know, are a series of videos on money um, by an American guy. Um, he's kind of giving them outdoors with the little whiteboard up in the mountains and stuff. They're, they're brilliant. Um, and uh, he, he does them under an assumed name. Um, and one of them is about Machiavellian government. And he explains, you know, this is this is how it all all works. And it is based on all of these things. Um, and, and these are, you can still look at them, I've linked to them in my website and what have you, um, uh, but they, they're heavily shadow banned and the gatekeepers absolutely hate them. On David's blog, there is a uh, thing he wrote called Rebranding Consent, okay, um, and he wrote up two days, it, it was... Um, and it's a, there's a huge long discussion. I mentioned this guy in this discussion, and there's a guy that really attacks me for it. And this great big there are there 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 are nearly 900 comments in that blog. Um, and Wes Wes Free, the inventor of Quanta, who, who, who uh, I've been trying to get hold of, um, I, I, and I've revisited visited Wes's work because. Tim Morgan with Seeds has got to a point where he's now again conflating financialization with an energy unit. Uh, I mean, if you if you look at some of the recent stuff I'm doing, it really it, it, 
it is cutting edge stuff and and um it gets away from this concision it gets away from the stack exchange idea of trying to um just justify answer, justify questions, yeah, it's, it's, questions and answers that that can it's about confirmation bias and the web has become a machine for confirmation bias that's what twitter does when, when, when you enable polemicists and polarities and binaries to uh dictate the discourse um you end up with um with precisely what you've got um the, the uh whereas the other way around where people have a free frame change of ideas i mean as an entrepreneur i was always taught uh, learn by your mistakes and encourage people to make mistakes because if the mistakes aren't being made in a business you're not learning anything you're not going anywhere well that's a very free will idea of the world in determinism there is one right answer and you do that so the opposite of, of my philosophy in business is the you never get sacked for buying an ibm analogy used in computing which applies to you know the justification and and, and, and playing it safe and the buggins turn stuff and this then you get into all the calvinist um um predestination stuff which is all the same so then you get to david graber and the best thing he ever wrote is that article in the commoner about the john kerry losing to george bush the second time around um when everyone threw their hands up in horror very similar to the hillary clinton experience with with donald trump they learned nothing then they've learned nothing since um and uh graver says that basically the the whole uh story of western philosophy boils down to the squabble between heraclitus and paramyenides which is basically a uh a difference in worldview and general philosophy between determinism and free will and that is it that's right uh, and when uh, and then it comes to the justification of hierarchical divine rights of kings whatever experts elites elitism that's where we've been headed we've been headed back to feudalism so when hayek wrote the road to serfdom okay um i'm not altogether sure whether he was against serfdom or not do you see what i mean i mean yeah, I, good point mm. you know um because there's a warning in there and that's sure that's where we're headed but i don't think um most of the libertarians that come up near as a high um you know most of the monetarists and all the rest of it there's there's kind of a, a massive kind of um cognitive dissonance going on there well, the other thing is, Roger, of course, serfdom is a relative term. I mean, as in when I say relative, I mean, I'm talking about the identity of the person who refers to it. Either yeah. you're my serf or uh, in, in which case I'm perfectly OK with serfdom. Um, you know, yeah. uh, you know, if I need to, if I need to have a, an equal conversation with yeah. someone, I, I can thought, hopefully go and find but, someone to do that with. The other day I saw that summed that up. There's this kid in the back garden digging a big hole. And the guy over the fence says, what are you doing there? She said, oh, I'm burying my goldfish. And, and he said, oh, so why are you digging such a big hole, hole silly? And she said, because it's inside your fucking cat. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Now, wh where are we going? Because um, I'm pretty sure that you were talking about lawyers and then you managed to bring in the stack exchange thing again well, well, uh, well, to do well, with discourse. Well, now, because I'm going to have to shoot off soon. So, well, um, that's just to do with justification. But wh where we need to get to is what mm. we're going to do about Grub Street Journal. Um, and I, what I think it is, is that we publish the journal within the browser. And the browser, obviously, um, people that use the browser get get the get the magazine, okay, which comes with the browser, and they can do the browser any way they like. You know, like I did Hypatia's browser on the start page thing, 
it's a really trivial method to have one of those of our own. I mean, there are several others, I and mean, you can use the Brave browser in a very similar way, which is how Decenter works. And they're all based on top of Chromium, which is an open source browser, which Google Chrome is on top of that. Um, but obviously, most people use Chrome and uh, uh, the Chromium. Google browser because the Google apps work best in there and there's an inertia for getting outside of it. So effectively, Google is designed to keep you in the frosted car. Right. The center as a browser. Is basically, you know, a heated windscreen. You know, in effect, um, and what what you want is 360 degree degree, uh, you know, vision that so you're not you, you, you have got the degrees of freedom to do a few clicks away. That's that, that's all it is. Right, to not be locked inside something. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's. Um, I remember it's in 2011. The freedom to inquire and the freedom to ask questions. So then when you I get read into um, language when, prisons and all of that sort of thing, you know. When I read Filter Bubble, when Filter Bubble came out in 2011 or something like that, B, you must have heard of that one by Eli Pariser. Um, oh. No. Yeah, so you know when people talk about filter bubbles, well, there's a guy who actually wrote a book called Filter Bubble, the Filter Bubble. I can't remember if he's, um, I can't remember if he ever worked for Google, but he does say at the beginning of it. So this is, this is probably 2011, 2012. He said there was a blog post on the Google website that referred to 57 different uh, types of uh, bracket that you can belong to, and you don't get to choose which one it is. Mm. And so that was the beginning of the Google filter conversation for me. Mm. Um, and which obviously, you know, within a few years led to different types of, you know, categorizing and, yeah. and, and being categorized and stuff like that. And it, for me, that sort of slightly relates to what you just said, which was, yeah. if you define me, you negate me. Um, oh. is, is, that, is that, is that, is that, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But is that, it, but is that the whole point? The yeah. moment that you try and say that I live within these particular parameters that you have imposed upon me, then you're definitely you but are you saying are you that, saying that, that i don't that, exist that, or are you just elemental. wrong it's elemental to linguistics it's elemental um to label you mean label yeah. yeah so in graph computing um you have links and labels and that you know they they have technical terms but what you're able to do with graph computing is access the the set theory okay i Oh, God, it's escaping me at the moment what, what it's called. But if you read about Tarski and Girdle, they do go on to set theory. And there is a school of thought that set, set this particular kind of set theory takes you beyond it. Um, but but um, graph computing is set theory. Finite elemental analysis is set theory. And so it, it's it's almost outside of. Well, you know how you're talking about systems and language and stuff like that. I found a book the other day because I teach English as a foreign language and I try to sort of write and write for broadcast now as well as just writing for blog posts. Mm -hmm. um, these are all only my own things. But um, what it said in this book that I found called Over Your Shoulder, it was written by Robert Graves, who I understand probably I wrote I, Claudius. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the poet as well, isn't he? Um, yeah. So it's in a it, it, brilliant poem called The Welsh Incident, which is hilarious. Uh, OK, yeah. well, one of the things that it says in this book is it talks about um, I think it talks about your Greek, your Teutonic languages and then English you know, and French. And I think it says that the more verbs it, 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 he sort of makes a point and then kind of contradicts himself. But you, you feel like he knows what he's talking about. He says the more tenses a verb has. Uh, sorry, a, a language has for its verbs, then the older you can tell it is. And almost in a platonic sense, he was kind of making it sound as though the closer it is to being able to actually have algorithms and describe, you know, sequences of what's actually happening. Um, and then it says, but the fewer, um, I can't remember what it was saying, but it then said that English is interesting because it's like when I was studying SAP, you have one module for this, for the factory, one for HR, one for this. But then you have the BI that sits on top, which is the 
which is reading from all of the different things. And because English is the bastard child of so many different children that were, in fact, the bastard children of other things, that there's something that reroutes that happens with English, where suddenly you have this language that isn't dependent on subject, verb, object in the same way, and that you can just have these really short sentences that um, get a lot done very quickly. And he was basically saying, that's permanently changing. And then when I watched a bit of American television and thought about how I can use English in American television to help people improve their English and stuff like that, I do remember thinking, obviously context is so well, much. The first rule of improving your English is don't watch American television. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm trying to be helpful here to people that might want to, you see, so that's the thing. I get what you're saying. I mean, it's certainly a joke I would have made 10 years ago, but um, unfortunately, you know, I've got to think about the what some people refer to the, or, you know, I try to be useful yeah. to someone, I do. But yeah, <laughs> I do um, agree. Yeah, I, I, this is the point Orwell makes in um, 1984 as well. Uh, he talks about the introduction to the American Constitution and saying uh, how re-rendering that in uh, Newspeak, you couldn't do it. You'd have to just call it thought crime. And then you would go on to a penny, what do they call it, a penegoric of... Um, uh, the importance mean, of a single state thing, whatever. Right, uh, okay, you're saying how would that development have been reported back then? Uh, yeah, but it, I, I did a meme called Das Feel, where I took, you know, called it um, Mao's Little Red Feel, Das Feel, and Mind Feel. Uh, 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 what does all, feel mean? Uh, well, basically, um, Climate communicators are told not to talk about the science because it's too hard and you've got to connect people with their feelings. And so I they're feel, busy right. psychoanalyzing all of the deniers. That's what they're saying. There's something wrong with you mentally because you don't agree with us. That And that, mm. you know, as I say, that's feel of that passage. I, I made a meme. So that, that, yeah, that reminds me of the biotech communicators playbook that I remember coming across in 2013. And, you know, you helped me with a PDF in relation to that, you know, the whole, you know, on either side. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, one last thing um, on Friday morning on the BBC, uh, and I think I'm going to do something. So when you called just now, I was I've decided to sort of do a kind of mini podcast um, okay. just as a sort of one off and let's see where it goes because it's cheaper for me to do. You know, I'm actually going to use television, but just the sound. Um, oh. I'm not saying I'm never going to do video. I just can't be asked to do it quickly. Um, but mm. um, I was listening to a little bit of Irish radio yesterday and they said that in Dublin, they have this thing called Human Rights Defenders and the UN rapporteur for um, defending against human rights violations, a French guy sounding, uh, he was in Dublin and he spoke and he basically said 321 people died of human rights violations uh, in 2018, uh, something like that, defending human rights so yeah activists defending human rights 321 were killed in 2018 the numbers may be going up we don't know uh, and he called on ireland to play a bigger role in calling out uh, corporations and it said mining and exploration companies seem to be quite big in this but then unfortunately the thing cut so i never got the end mm. um, but so i'm starting off by saying oh I, you know I, I was wandering on irish radio i heard this then i play the clip but just before I play the clip, I say, I also just found out that the new head of BP is Irish. Mm -hmm. um, so I play the clip and then afterwards I'm thinking of saying, you know, maybe maybe taking over BP is the best way to do this. I don't know. You know, this is me just sort of kind of philosophically joking around. Um, well, oil companies are just so integrally mixed up in geopolitics. You know, the, the current attempted color revolution going on in Iraq again. I mean, it's just another attempted military coup to stop them going the way of Syria, i.e. aligning with Russia and China. Um, right. That's, that's the subtext of, of, of so much of this stuff. This Kurtz guy, um, he, he posted the old regular one about, is Denmark going to end up like Sweden and all of this? Uh, I posted a link to a documentary called The Swedish Theory of Love, and um, I, I did a a whole bunch of blogs on this stuff. Um, but uh, there's a Swedish, Anglo-Swedish writer called uh, uh, Pelle Nor. Um, 
and he wrote a book about who killed Olaf Palmer. Mm. Made excellent films about that. Um, great guy. I mean, very, very uh, interesting. Um, but it's that's all part of the same thing. Um, and going back to Brexit, EU military unification, NATO, Sweden, and fin Finland. It's a very interesting dynamic going on. And Pele's work really gets at that. Um, and when the submarine hunting was going on in uh, the archipelago around, uh, he, he looks at that and um, he wrote... You're talking about in the 40s? No, 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 no. This was in the 1980s. Right. Um, and effectively, it's been proven that, that the subs that the Swedes were looking for were NATO subs, not Russian subs. And it was there to, 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 to try and get the Swedish people nervous about things uh, i.e to try and get sweden overtly into nato but they're doing it by the back door with eu military in integration now no, they're not in it now oh because no, they're no, neutral no. aren't they because they, they, they're they're wise and neutral aren't they because they they do they actually have a border with russia they don't do they no but um st petersburg used to be part of the swedish um kingdom you see right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Finland and Sweden uh, and Russia have got a, a, a long beef, which went on, you know, the Second World War. There was a big yeah. thing between Sweden and Russia. Um, but uh, Sweden, as a kingdom, used to be, you know, Denmark, uh, Norway, Finland, and a huge chunk of uh, of Russia. Saint Petersburg was a Swedish city. It's very well, simple. Yes, yesterday on the yesterday on the BBC. Uh, you know, Andrew Marr, so, you know, very controlled. Um, at one point they said, oh, and we've got um, we've got the leader of a European country here as well, because, you know, the, he's got to go, whatever gets proposed, he's got to v get it to the vote. And so the person who they chose was a um, very American accent. It was uh, whoever runs Latvia. And uh, that was funny. I mean, he just, he, you know, I mean, when I say it was funny, it, not so much for what he said, but more for who... You, you're, you're the, I, 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 there's a, I watched a comedy sketch the other day and it was um, an Italian comedian and he said, I, I speak with an American accent, he said, you know, and, and he said, I learned to speak in an American accent because I go to Germany and they all say, oh, that's really cool, fantastic, you saved us in the war, you know, I, you know, I go to different places and, 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 and they all think, he said, then I came to England, <laughs> 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 where, where people don't think it's cool. He's very, it's very, it's a really funny, I mean, it's, it, there's a, it's on a channel, which is a politically incorrect comedy channel, 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 um, and, and it's very, very funny. I uh, mean, the thing is that, let's say you're playing cricket, right, which I don't do, but I have done, and you're in the pavilion, you know, your 11th man, right, <laughs> or something like that. 12th man. <laughs> yeah, you're, in, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm you're, 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 you're not, you're not super agile. And, you know, you're called to the crease mm -hmm. and you go out there and, you know, you don't know what this guy's going to do. He's probably going to bowl you a googly or something like that. You just don't know. And, you know, what you have to do is you have to basically just deal with the situation at hand. You just have to do whatever you're, whatever the right thing to do under those circumstances. are. I don't mean following instructions. You know, you could get shit if you fuck it up, but you've got to kind of do the right thing. So when I see this Latvian guy on there. You know, it it really is um, that whole thing where it's not what is said, but who is saying it. They just got someone to say it. But what I thought was hilarious is that, you know, just like with Finland and Sweden and all these other things, you know, he was on the line. You know, they belong to the Soviet Union. You've got this stuff going on with Zelensky and Ukraine and all these other things. And yet we go to him to say well, you know, if you make it look like it's your final offer, then we're not really going to be able to do anything and smile. You know, we're really interested. So everyone's playing this ambiguous game. And you're also thinking, look, you've got Ireland over there, Latvia over here, Luxembourg over there. You've got these tiny little countries who have such clout. Wolfgang Munchau, um, who writes for the FT Weekly, German guy. Uh, Perry Merling says he's brilliant. Even 10 years ago, he said that. Um, I saw an article that he wrote yesterday about an hour after it came out and he basically said um, if in Brussels they do not accept or at least 
look like they're going to accept most of what Boris has offered, then uh, they really are shooting themselves in the foot massively. Because what's happening it's, it's here... It's Cameron all over again. But, you know, it's, but it was interesting, though, what he was saying. He said Brussels absolutely have to either fully or mostly i mean he said fully is ridiculous so they have to mostly accept what boris is offering because if they don't then they will be the ones who have taken two offers or something like that turn them down and it basically becomes where who is being blamed is worse than the actual deal um well, but i thought i thought it was a brilliant I article i disagree with you with that analysis um I mean, my, my, my analysis is much more cynical than that. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're coming from outside the system, the Tarski analysis. I am. This is the Tarski analysis. Um, Boris is just finishing the job that Cameron started. Cameron came back, peace in my time and all the rest of it. Then had to, you know, had to have the referendum and all the rest of it. Um, May came back with the diktat from Brussels and they thought they'd maybe sneak it through that way um but i don't think boris is playing with a straight bat i really don't but i don't think nigel farage is either um and the establishment uh this isn't about brexit it's not about being in the eu it's not about eu military unification or nato per se what what this is all about is getting different populations within the grander UN umbrella getting ready for world government. That's what this is about. Um, and of course, all of the politicians are just, you know, doing the loyally thing, trying to figure a way of justifying things. In many ways, the most honest person on this is Joe Swinson, because it's just so overt with her you know, the, 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 the scurrying to get to the trough with her. You can just see it quite clearly. And it's actually quite a breath of fresh air. I can't stand the woman, but, you know. So, that, so that, what that. you're saying is she's one of the few people that has been told, one, there is a game. Two, here are the rules that you are being given. Three, get on with it. Whereas I'm everyone else... I she even knows that. But I think she's being... By being so nakedly um, self-interested ignoring 17.4 million votes uh, there's an interview that um oh what's he called um miles oh the mirror editor thing what's he called kevin mcguire uh, no no kevin no no, McGuire, no the political the editor went to cnn and worked there for a while uh, uh, piers morgan piers morgan yeah piers morgan interviewing joe swinson on good morning television and it's brilliant. Watch it. Watch it. It's hilarious. You see, I like him. I do like him. It's something I, his father was, I think, a colonel in the army and his brother is actually still serving. I, I, there's a, you know, I've got the same, a similar background. And so it's very, you know, there's, there's, there, there's something about being a forces brat that gives you a, a kind of a cynical view on, on on politicians and stuff like that and i think what it is 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 that if they fuck up you're the ones that got to go off and fight the war for them and i think that kind of filters down to you as a kid in that environment um you know it's the, the, the you, you hear about these people you know that i.e the, the donkeys leading lions you know sending people into harm's way um but, on, but so on. he's big big dollop of that and i like him for it you know you know i, I you know I, I i mean there's 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 a sort of a frivolous side to a lot of his work but you know at, at, at its heart i like him i do like him i'm, I'm no thinking I'm th on I, when when we terminate this call i'm thinking of grabbing the video and the bit where you talk about joe swinson if it turns out that that can belong in less than two minutes twenty, mm. I think I think that's going to get subtitled and tweeted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'll try and give it the context that you yourself have given it, which is to say she's the most honest, and then just say because of that, <laughs> <laughs> and then I just watch you sort of you know, palpitate and just foam. The Lib Dems at the coming election. <laughs> yeah, 
and then say, listen, people, you've got to watch a little bit of the rest of the video. We'll just go back an extra 30 seconds and you hear the world government part. <laughs> Well, that's the context thing, and and, and um, this is the thing I did, which I was quite. I, I've been giggling away to myself. I, I've been working on this this morning. Now, Eddie Hearn is a boxing promoter. I, I'm I'm a very keen boxing fan. I, I like I, I like. Hold on, hold on. Boxing. Is Eddie Hearn? Is it is it him or is it the dad? There's Barry Hearn Barry. and Eddie Hearn. Barry is the dad. Who's brilliant? I, ba- Barry Hearn is interviewed. Um, Oh, someone interviews him. Um, Did he get shot, or was that Frank Warren, or maybe Frank both Warren's of them? Shot. Frank Warren used to have the office next door to mine in Docklands back in the day. Fucking hell! <laughs> I always knew that you were I, a bit I, gangster, I, Roger. Frank is great, I, 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 but Eddie, Eddie Hearn and Frank really don't like each other, right? Well, hold on, hold on. Is one of them a woman now? No. Yes. No. Yes. Oh no, that's Frank Malone. Oh, really? Frank Malone that used to ma- manage... Um... Frank Bruno. Frank Bruno, yeah. I'm sure. It was, it was, Frank used to be looked after by Terry Lawless before, you see. Um, right. I used to hang out with... Um, there's a guy called Jimmy Batten, who, who's, who's a famous um, featherweight East End boxer, and he used to do the karaoke nights at a bar I used to drink in. A brilliant guy, really nice voice, great singer. And... Uh, um, he he went the distance with Alberto Duran, who's one of the pound for pound great fighters in the world, and and uh, uh, he, he was a hero amongst you know me and all my mates in Docklands, and 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 uh, lovely guy, lovely guy. There's another guy called Charlie Magri, another famous East End boxer, who had a wonderful boxing shop on the Mile End Road, or or, or one of you know uh, might be in the White Castle. Well, well, Frank Frank Warren. I mean, that guy, man, what a prick. What he's doing at the moment, I mean, I'm sure you're going to turn around and say, oh, no, it's all brilliant, it's all good stuff. <laughs> he's basically organising, I don't know if it's been done yet, but he's doing the fight, the rematch between Anthony Joshua and um, what's and what's his name? Is it Carlos Ruiz? Ruiz, anyway. Ruiz and, and Joshua, that, that's Eddie Hearn, and they're, they're doing it in Saudi. I thought it was Malone. No, I mean, no. Warren, I thought it was Warren. No, Warren. no, no, Frank. Frank is the promoter for no, but is it is so, hold on it's not it's not warren no frank frank warren promotes um oh god he, okay. he promotes the lineal world champion um who's right. a, uh who's basically a, a, an irish gypsy traveler um, you mean the mmr what, guy or tyson uh, fury no, no no tyson fury and i love tyson fury he's brilliant and i love yeah. his dad Love his dad. They're, they're absolute. You see, the thing is about Irish travellers, okay, is they're basically like they're like druids, okay. Uh, and if you watch the the documentary I put up on the last druid on my Bitshoot channel, okay, and watch that, um, the last kind of you know chief of the druids, if you call him that, okay, um, he's talking about Pelagius who was an Irish monk, and he's basically saying Pelagius was a druid, right? And, um, and I can believe it. You see, I, I'm Welsh. I mean, I, I, my middle name is Glyndor, for God's sake. That's, that's the name of the last king of Wales, Owen Glyndor. Um, and, uh, you know, that's in me. You know, I, I, you know I, there's a huge streak of being a druid in me. You Did know, you grow up speaking Welsh? No, no. My, gran- my grandmother did, and... Uh, um, she was from a, a, a community called Gilvercork, which is up in the Rhonda Valley, right at the top of the valley. And she grew up to, uh, learning Welsh, and she used to get beaten at school if she spoke Welsh, literally beaten, because the English uh, wouldn't let Welsh-speaking children speak Welsh in school. So one of my favourite poems is that one about the foreign tongue. By, by the Indian poetess. I, I've told you about it before. Um, uh, and it's just the most amazing poem. But, but it's talking about how language, um, you know, becomes the army of occupation. And right. how, you know, mother tongues, you know, are extinguished by occupying forces. And she's kind of saying how she loves the English language, but it's robbed her of her, you know, yeah. 
of the mother tongue, uh, you know, and it's a bit like that. So um, and I've got lots of stories about experiences of, of being in the company of people that only speak Welsh and not saying anything, but just listening and thinking, well, that's my that's my heritage. But you can pronounce it. I mean, you pronounce it properly, don't you? Well, just... no, I would, seriously, I can't even mimic a. I can't mimic a Welsh accent. I can a bit. My my parents both had Welsh accents. Uh, mm. My father was fl- a fluent German speaker, and he tried to learn uh, Welsh after he retired, but he gave up. It was too hard. It's a very hard language to get your head round as an English speaker. German's much easier than Swedish. Mm. Well, Roger, look, we've hit half eight. It's been brilliant. I've got to try and put out this. I'd, how many minutes should I do it? I'm, but it's just me, and I'm using clips, so it's just me talking, you know, into this microphone well, in between a few clips and making a few points. A long one, break it up into chapters, and then you know you can you, you can release them on YouTube, premiere them, you know, and and and, and get people into the flow that way, so they okay. can work self-contained but but that you know play how, how how short how short do you reckon is okay five minutes ten minutes uh or way more if you look at your analytics you'll see uh, you, it shows you how how much of each video is watched so the play time mm. and uh it's the first two or three minutes that get watched mostly and in a playlist you'll see that a popular video maybe will have a thousand views at the front and the fifth one in the series will end up with 200 views yeah and this is this is the attention span thing and um so effectively it's the old saying about tell them what you're going to tell them tell them and then then tell them what you told them uh so so you know that they definitely heard it <laughs> well at the front end you just have to yeah. this is about and and, and and the title as well the title the tags the first two minutes and then the rest is really just for people that are you know looking for something more than just a confirmation okay brilliant. Of whatever prejudice they bring to the initial well, in, in the one that i'm doing at the moment so that's interesting because it means that every time i see so in you know how in on the stock market you have this concept of arbitrage you know uh-huh. sort of so two prices for the same product you know absent mm-hmm. transaction costs zero risk risk-free profit so in the same way as undertakers of other types of social activity such as observation like us then um you know you just see two things that don't fit and you say well you know i can point it out and then as you say a justifier can tell us oh, well that's because of this you idiot and we'll say oh thanks a lot yeah I'll, I'll i won't ever i won't ever publish anything again just, just, just to finish where we were up to because we we're about to i just want to tell you i i've done this uh the, the, the last post I did on my train of thought, which I started off with, started this. Uh, there's a channel on Twitter called No Context Hearn. Okay. Eddie Hearn loves it. And it's basically just these clips of Eddie Hearn completely out of context of what he's saying. I mean, he's, he's a great talker. I used, to like, I used to like going to street markets and listening to the Barrow Boys, you know. Well, they say, oh, come on, Mrs. You know, and all of the banter. And, 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 you know, I loved all that stuff. I mean, I used to be a carpet salesman. I used to be able to do a bit of it myself. But, you know, it, it, <laughs> Hearn is a master of, of the band. And uh, I, I like him. I mean, I had lots and lots of friends that are like Eddie Hearn. <laughs> it's, uh, um, but but um, anyway, no context Hearn. And um, uh, it's. It's funny because it says so much. And so I put a couple of boxing analogies in. Now, on Ruiz and Joshua, who you mentioned, OK, um, there's a famous uh, uh, boxer from the 80s that's on Sky Sports now. OK, and he was basically saying Joshua was going to beat Ruiz a thousand percent. And there's this big discussion goes on between a guy called uh adam smith who's the sky boxing commentator and in charge of boxing at sky sports um uh an east end boxer who had a bad injury um uh is it is it uh uh, then there's this other guy um and then there's the the, one of the ring announcers and they have this 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 discussion and they could be talking anything but what's it what's interesting is noam chomsky says 
the bounds of what you're allowed to discuss. The reason in America you'll find people they'll know everything about baseball cards, they'll know everything about the baseball leagues. Same in Britain, people know about the transfer market and they talk about all of that stuff, right? And people use their intellectual capacity to talk about this stuff because they're allowed to, right? And when I was telling you about Chomsky Chant, this is what he said to me. He said, I like what you're doing with your music and your channel because you're trying to bring that popular culture into some of these wider issues of political economy, right? So um, who said that to you? Um, the guy that had, that, that had the Chomsky Chant channel, and, and uh, which is on YouTube. He's a, he's a friend of mine on Luke LinkedIn or a connection. Um, and but he said he liked he liked the way that you were, he liked the way you were bringing in popular culture to bigger ideas. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, I mean, there are nearly a thousand videos on my YouTube channel, and they started off just with guitar learning lessons because it's basically a good way to learn a musical instrument is you listen to yourself and watch what you're doing, and 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 it, it it's good for refreshing your memory, but you actually hear what it how you're doing. Right. Yeah. And, and, and of course, if you put them up on YouTube, people take the piss out of you. But that doesn't. But that's you know, you just have to forget about that because yeah. you're trying to get somewhere. And 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 people you're learning, yeah, yeah. But people can point out to you, well, you're doing that wrong. Try this, and um, that's yeah. the only way to learn is by doing observation, and by going yeah, right. where you've got to. Yeah. Right? And um, but but people want a finished product. This is again the stack exchange thing. They want the finished answer, the definitive answer. They want, basically, it's binary. They want a zero or a one. And the zero and ones aren't important. It's the point between. It's the infinite point between. And that's the point I make about music, musical notes are subjective. You know, and, you know, it, this is, then you get to... What, because you mean, because there is no final version. That's, that's kind of what you mean, isn't it? Well, no, you it said, whatever you hear is just what you it, happen it, to be it, hearing. David Malone, our friend David, always says it best. He says you have to challenge the starting assumptions. Okay, so starting assumptions for me, that's what are your boundary conditions for making that statement. So as a as a maths nerd, yeah. you know, that's what I'm interested in, right? But but David, who's a much better communicator than me, you know, he says you have to challenge the starting assumptions. If you don't challenge the starting assumptions, and you actually take the arguments with the starting assumptions that are imposed upon you you are never going to win the argument and that's the justification bit that's what lawyers do yeah 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 i remember you told me that they call it the frames of reference as well at the beginning and things like that no you said something about of understanding framework something. of understanding that that's a chomsky idea and it's absolutely right yeah i, I did a, a video called um signs and of it, which is Chomsky and the professor of artificial intelligence at MIT, who's um, he's called Win Winston, Professor Winston, who's absolutely amazing. He, he tells this story about um, the idea of what is drinking and how we compute that in our minds. He talks about a you know a dripping tap, a glass, you know, right. and, 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 and about how, how they're all drinking. So it's that one word, and you know it's that even though it's not, you know. So, so many versions of the same thing, of yeah. the same term. I mean, he says we're a wash in stories. And, of course, that's the challenge of artificial intelligence. And what I said to David about artificial intelligence is we are intelligent precisely because we can think outside of the box. Our subconscious takes us into the undecidability part of it. And then I also make the point which Stafford Beard makes, um, uh, Stafford Beer makes about uh, a very famous computer scientist who, who, who says that um, on undecidable matters, you have to go with your gut feel or flip a coin. It's the only rational thing to do. Now, determinists, they can't live with that. That, that is just too, so for a militant atheist, that is just too much to take on board. Science will give you the answer. They believe in science. It's a belief system, pure and simple. Well, I am appreciative of, but not excluding everything else, the advice that you just gave me about um, how to go ahead with little 
you know, tell them, tell them and tell it again, maybe two minute things because I'm, I'm interspersing it with clips. So hmm. essentially I'm going to say, here's the Irish human rights story. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, here's the story from Reuters about how there's an Irish guy in charge of BP. I'm not saying this means anything. I'm just saying, you know, as you said, let's well, call it un well, undecidable. It's it's definitely true, but that's it. And it's the same thing with three minute pop songs. You know, there's a very good reason why shorter pop songs generally make it into charts. It's why Bohemian Rhapsody should never have been number one for so long. It was such an outlier. It was, you know, but or Stairway to Heaven, stuff like that. Mm. Um, but, but um, you know, the perfect pop song. I mean, I've got a friend of mine. He, he wrote the theme tune to um, uh, Timmy Time, you know, Hardman Animations. He's a guy called Mike Stobby, who, who's a genius piano player and musician, composer, arranger. You know, he's done loads of West End. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. He's a very, very good. He's one of my best friends. Um, and... Uh, Mike and I have talked a lot about what the perfect pop song is. Oh, What's, his name? What's his name? Mike Stobby. Right. S T O B B I E. I mean, he's famous. He used to be in Palace. He's a keyboard player. Um, but anyway, that, that, that's Mike. Um, and I've got another friend, um, very good friend, uh, Mark, Mark Jackson Burroughs. Uh, he, he's a really famous music producer. He's, um, oh dear. Um, Called Bim, they're Bimbo Jones. It's him, 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 and a guy called Lee Dagger, and they're like hugely famous in you know in very posh circles. Um, he like he's a DJ, but but they, Bimbo Jones is a great, uh, fantastic band they were. I mean, Mark again, genius piano player. He's a jazz. He's a genius jazzer, and of course does all this sort of pop music. Uh, they've remixed everybody. You know, Thunder in My Heart, when it was remixed and put out again by Leo Sayer, that, that was Mark and, 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 uh, and Lee. Right, OK. And they've done a lot. They've done Pink and they've done Beyonce. They, they, you know, everybody wants them to do a dance remix. That they're the guys you go to. But like right. I said, Mark is, is, you know, he's like a little brother to me. Yeah. OK, well, I shall, I shall remain condensed in what I do, I think. Uh, oh. But obviously, it's short form, long form, so... Every so often, I'll try and work it out. But yeah, I mean, I'm having fun because it's the first time I'm sort of doing it by myself. Mm. Uh, sort of, what's the word? It feels a bit, you know, if we have a chat, it's okay because it's live and we can do it. But the bit where I'm sort of thinking, right, okay, don't have any collaborators. I'll just take clips mm. um, and then talk in between them. So, for example, the thing is well, that pretty... Well, I like what you're doing. I mean, I do watch them. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I tweet and I put a comment in and stuff. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's a tip. Um Make yourself a Reverb Nation channel, okay? What does that mean? Reverb, Reverb Nation. I, I made a page on Reverb Nation for David when he was running for the Green Party. And it's for bands, but it's for spoken word and perks and stuff. But Reverb Nation um, has absolutely loads and loads of widgets that you can embed on websites for things like getting a mailing list, uh, posting gigs. But you could use it to post your next video and all the rest of it. It's built around the idea of building a following as a band and getting get signed as a record. Oh, right. Reverb Nation, absolutely fantastic. Um, and then there's another one called Fandalism. Um, same thing. Um, not nearly as popular as Reverb Nation, not been going as long. But those two things as a tool in conjunction with your YouTube channel will feed people in. Um, and and that those two... It's it's full of creative people, uh, and they're very very supportive of each other. Nice. Or props and stuff, and 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 that's that's the way to go because uh, and that's where you look. That, that's how you reach out in the grey space. You know, like David Bowie. That I, I love that interview you did with Jeremy Paxman about the internet, talking about right, yeah, 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 ages ago, uh, yeah. Uh, it was great, 97 wasn't it that one i remember that yeah yeah it was it was a long time ago I mean, it was prescient to say the least on on behalf of bowery and and, yeah. and you know I, I, paxman what he's a gatekeeper i like him his, his book the english is just fantastic um but but he's you know he's not there to to free your mind <laughs> yeah well i think they brought him in after um 
because I saw this book that he did in 1983 on chemical weapons, and I think it's called A Higher Form of Killing. Mm -hmm. And I think probably once he'd written that, they just said, look, just come in. We really don't want someone like you. You know, like we could have just let you in. We haven't, but we're definitely letting you in now because there's no way we want someone like you roaming around turning John Pilger or whatever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I like John Pilger too. I don't really. I mean, my cousin gave me a John Pilger book when I was 14. I've talked and... about his films. I've never read one of his books. Oh, uh, right. Well, I mean, it's good. The thing is, when I say I don't like him, I mean, I sort of... That... Have you watched his stuff about um, Sri Lanka? Um... He made a very powerful. The last film I saw of his was about 2007, but um, it was very good. I mean, it's pretty disturbing. Um, I can't really go near anything that he has anything to do with, just because I just find it so depressing. I'm not saying it isn't completely true. No, I, um, well, that, I think that's the thing. I, mean, I think a lot of those guys have pretty serious post-traumatic stress stress syndrome. I can't handle it at all. Um, yeah, so the book that my cousin gave me it was called distant voices uh probably written in 91 92 i'd started boarding school and um it was it basically i was 14 13 14 and it basically just says so you know anything that you watch on the tv is probably controlled by either maxwell black or murdoch mm. and then it just goes through the canadian american and british australian press mm. and um so bit by bit, I thought, you know what? I mean, I was expelled within, I possibly within days of starting that book. Oh, I mean, wow. that's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I'm sure that there was a big, big, big connection you mm. know, where I was and what I was reading. And sort of, I sort of got propelled out of there. The thing is, the last place you need to be if you've got a brain is a school. I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, fair play. <laughs> anyway, there we are. <laughs> yeah, great talking to you, Roger, and um, I look forward to um, our next chat. And you. Cheers, See you Roger. In a bit. Take Bye. care.